distracted. As we enter into the season of Easter, we're looking at some of the most prominent teachings of Jesus as he's pointing out some ways that we can be distracted from fully following him and fully embracing the joy of Easter. Here's my question for today. How do you get somebody to love you? Here's the passage from the Bible. It's Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So begins one of the most beloved stories in all of time, the prodigal son. And in this story of Jesus, there are three main characters. We got the father, and we have the two sons. Now, what one of the things we know from the very beginning is that this father, he loves his sons. As we dig into the story today, here's what I want you to be asking. Do these sons, do they love the father? Well, the spotlight for the prodigal son typically goes to the younger son, and we're going to get there, but let's start this way. Let's start with the older son son. I mean, in those days, the oldest son just wasn't the oldest. He was the firstborn. He was the firstborn boy, which meant in those cultures he was the heir. Deuteronomy 21, 17 gives us the context this way. It says, he must acknowledge the firstborn by giving him a double share of all he has. That son is the first sign of his father's strength The right of the firstborn belongs to him. See, the firstborn son had double inheritance, special paternal blessing, family birthright. Firstborn son wasn't just the firstborn. He was the heir. Well, times have changed, but there are still some advantages to being the firstborn. Well, when first time our firstborn dropped his binky on the floor... It was like, oh no, crisis, what are we going to do? Could be contaminated. Somebody call the hazmat crew. A couple years later, our second, she drops her binky on the floor, and then I picked it up, and I wiped it off on my shirt. It's good enough. Well, poor number three. You know, number three comes around, she drops her binky on the floor, and I'm like, I just look at her, and I say, I, I'm tired. Pick it up yourself, kid. <laughs> I mean, parenting, it kind of wears us down a little bit. This guy, Jesus tells us, this man, he had two sons. Well, the older brother, there's some advantages to being the older brother. There's also a few disadvantages. Any of you the oldest kid in your family? I mean, you know what your first mission in life was. If you're the oldest child, your first mission in life was to break in mom and dad. That mom and dad, they're, they're green, they're rookies. They really don't know what it is that they're doing. Well, in this story, Jesus tells us about this older son. It lets us know this older son, well, he's a good son. He obeyed the rules. He honored his family. He fulfilled his family responsibilities. He spent his life investing into the family business. Well, baby brother ran off and was sowing his wild oats. Older brother, he stayed home and he helped harvest them. The older brother, he honored the father. He obeyed the father. He respected the father. Did he love the father? Verse 29, the older brother said, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Never disobeyed your orders. This older son never disobeyed his father's orders. He obeyed his father. He honored his father. He respected his father. But did he love his father? Look at how Jesus describes that relationship. Verse 29 says, All these years I have been what? Yeah, slaving for you. 
Is that the language of love? He didn't say, all these years, you know, I've been working for you. He didn't say, you know, Dad, all these years I've been working with you. Didn't even say, you know, Dad, all these years I've been working alongside of you. What did he say? How did he put it? He said, all these years, Dad, I have been slaving. I've been slaving for you. Does that describe your relationship with God? Maybe even a little bit? Because I think when Jesus tells this story, he's anticipating that most of us will identify with one of these two sons. And maybe you can identify with, with this older son. And the reality is, you know, you're trying to do the right thing trying to live a clean life, and you're trying to follow the rules. But here's one of the things that happens when we live life that way. Suddenly things can sneak into our subconscious, and we can start expecting things like a payoff. Well, I, I've been doing all these things for him. Now it's time for me to get a little bit of a reward, for us to start having thoughts. You know, Dad, he owes me. We, we can get into a state of mind where we actually start to feel a little bit entitled. I did this, so he owes me for that. And this tendency is to, to get a little bit of pride, to get a little bit judgy, to start to compare with other people, thinking things like, not fair, not fair, not fair. When you read the story of the prodigal son, anybody connect with this older brother? Well, how about the small fry, right? He, verse 11 tells us this. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. See, for the little brother recognized his life, it was good. Daddy was rich. Brother was loyal. He was loaded. He had it, and he had it good, but he still wanted it better. On one particular day, he waltzes up to the father, and he says, you know, Dad, this isn't working for me. I don't just want to be the son of a rich man. I want to be a rich man, and I can't wait until you die. I want my inheritance, and I want it now. Verse 13. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. When you hear this story of Jesus, the story of the prodigal son, anybody relate to this guy, to the younger son? Maybe your mind goes back and you think about your own history and you think, man, some of the things that I've done, some of the decisions that I've made, you know, I know what it's like to do life in a distant country. I know that. I know what it's like to be a long ways away from God. I know what it's like to wake up in a pigsty. I know that life. I know that emptiness. I know what that feels like. Well, maybe you relate to him and you think there was a season in my life when, well, the, the father loved me, but I didn't really trust him. When I was just doing my own thing. In this story that Jesus tells, the younger son, well, the day comes when he comes to his senses. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He repented. He came clean. He got honest. He did that. And Jesus is saying, well, so can we. That there can be a part of this story in every one of our stories. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're doing, no matter what kind of pig pen you find yourself in today, Jesus is saying, you're still welcome back. The Father, his arms are open wide. He's saying, you're still loved, you're still embraced. Come back. Maybe today is the day for you to just respond to God, to say, Lord, today I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. The story of the prodigal son. We got the older son. We got the younger son. 
Well, now how about the Father? Because this story, I think it's designed to, to tell us a lot about this, well, about this Father. I mean, imagine what it would be like to be the Father in the story of the prodigal son. Imagine what it would be like to have, you know, a child of yours come up and say, you know, Dad, this isn't really working for me. I, I don't just want to be the, the son of a rich guy. I want to be a rich guy. I can't wait until you die. I want my inheritance. I want it now. That had to hurt. So how does this father respond? He could have said, you know, you little ingrate. I brought you into this world. I can take you back out. But he doesn't do that. Rather, this father, he did this. Verse 12, he divided his property between them. See, that's kind of odd to me. I'm familiar with the story of the prodigal son. I imagine a lot of you are too. And what happens to me when I read this story of the prodigal son, I really usually get caught, so caught up in the end of this story. I, I get caught up in the younger son and him going back and being greeted. I like that part of the story. And then I can get caught up in the story of the older son and him getting angry and kind of bitter. I can get so caught up in the end of this story that I miss the beginning of it. Look at what happens right here at the beginning. The father, he gives this kid the cash. The kid says, man, I I'm out of here. Give me my inheritance so I can go do whatever I want to do. And this father, he gives him the money and he lets him go. Isn't that kind of odd? I think, well, why? Why would this father do that? How could he do that? I mean, I think that this father probably knew his son was going to blow it. I imagine he knew his, his son, he was going to go off and sin. How could he let his son go? Is this a classic case of passive parenting? I, I don't think so. Actually, I think the opposite is true. For years, I imagine that this father, he's tried everything. He's tried the rod with his son. He's tried the rules with his son. He's tried reason with his son. I think this father knows and recognizes, you know, the only way this rebellious son of mine is going to learn is the hard way. Anybody taking that path? The hard way. No, this, the hard way is not the only way. That's not the recommended way, but sometimes the hard way is the only way that some people learn. Some of you, well, you're there. Maybe you're there as, as a parent and you are realizing, I can't make decisions for them. Or maybe it's as a peer, or maybe it's somebody else in your family. You can give wisdom, and you can get, give advice, and you can speak truth. But the reality is, I can't make decisions for them, and it's hard, and it hurts. So why? What does this tell us about the father? Well, this father, he let his son go. This father... He, he gave him his freedom. This father, he let the consequences of life do the teaching because this father, he didn't just want obligatory obedience. This father, he didn't just want forced compliance. This father, he didn't just want imposed respect. What did he want? This father and the prodigal son, here's what he wanted. This father, he just wanted to be loved. He just wanted his kids to love him back. How do you get that? How do you get somebody to love you? And I want to pause for just a moment of real transparent honesty here to say, you know, me standing in front of you addressing the topic, how do you get somebody to love you? Highly ironic, 
because I'm about as romantic as this chair over here. <laughs> Not a great topic for me. So let me maybe ask it this way. Let me ask it this way. What would God have to do to get you to love him? Ever think about that? I mean, what if, what if God would give you a, a clear miracle? You know, you're driving along. A car from the other side of the road jumps the median. It's, it's headed right towards you. You don't have time to, to move, to get out of the way, to slow down, to stop. All of a sudden, a hand comes between you and this car protects you. It is a clear miracle. No other explanation. How would you respond to that? I mean, for me, if I would get a very clear miracle from God, I would, I would certainly believe in his existence. And I think I would probably be really thankful to him. But would I love him? Or what if God were just to, to show up? Sometimes I'll have people say, man, I wish I could just see God. I wish I could just know for certain that he's right there with me. I wish I could see him. What if God did that? What if he just revealed himself to you? How would you respond to that? Well, we don't really have to guess. Look at how he revealed himself in the Bible to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. We see this. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. And then in verse 3, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. How would you respond if you experienced that? You know, if I were to witness the glory of God, I imagine I would drop to my knees. I would be in awe of him. I would have a very great respect for him. But would I, would I love him? What would it take for you for God to get you to love him? What if we were, he were to pamper you? What if he, he were to remove all of your problems and give you a life of ease? What if he removed all your challenges and difficulties, if he parted all your Red Seas, if he slayed all your giants? How would you respond to that? I mean, I, I think if God gave me a life of leisure, I'd stick with him. I'd stick with him like a dog on a bone. You know, I, I'd, I'd be in it for the goodies. But would I love him? What would God have to do to get you to love him? And what if, what if we, we kind of misunderstand God? What if our preconceived idea of God's goal isn't really his goal? What if God's goal isn't to get us to obey him? What if God's goal isn't to get us to respect him? What if God's goal isn't even to get us to believe that he exists? What if God's goal is to get us to love him? How would that change things? What could he do? What could he possibly do? See, I think that's the best explanation for why God did this. Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. To those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. In verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What would God have to do to get you to love him? How about the most powerful, the most holy, the most 
awesome being in all of reality, the one who has no beginning and no end, the one who can create a universe with but a word, the one who was and is and is to come. How about him becoming a human baby, helpless, dependent, needy? Why? Well, so he could do this the cross you know the season of Easter let's not forget let's not take him for granted let's not over Look, Easter, uh, unlike any season, shows us not only what God says, it shows us what this God of ours has done. He has served, he has sacrificed, he has gone all the way to the cross. Why? He gave his life to forgive our sins. And doesn't end there. He was resurrected so that we could have his power to do life his way. He puts it this way, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Let's read this together. Join me. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? He tells us the why. He flat out gives us the reason for this Easter season to demonstrate his love for us. I can honor a God who knows my future and who knows my past. I, I, I can obey a being whose authority knows no bounds. And I can respect a being who holds my life and death in his hands. But a being who does this, 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. What do I do with that? See, me? I can love a God like that. You know, the God who, the one who created the whole works, if he wanted to, he could demand my obedience. He, he's got more than enough power. He could demand my respect, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that because he doesn't want that. What does he want? He doesn't want your obligatory allegiance. What does he want? He wants, he wants your heart. He wants your love. He wants your trust. Luke chapter 15, a prodigal son. In this we see, well, that father, that's our father, that's our heavenly father. And he loves us deeply, dearly. We're always welcome. His arms are always open wide. And not only does his heavenly father love us, there's also this, he also wants us us to love him back. Wow. My love matters to him. He wants us to seek him, to pursue him, to follow him, to spend time with him, to talk with him, to share with him, to trust him. What would God have to do to get you to love him? Hasn't he already done that? 